My comments here will be familiar ones for some of the thoughts they've been deliberately putting out there in the past few days about the roles of evidence, about illuminating other areas of a system, about cluing us in as new data comes in to help take it into account. But my, uh, my comments here will be uh, specifically uh, seeking to enrich uh, our understanding of particle filtering uh, so that we can lace the groundwork for tomorrow's, uh, tomorrow's discussions, okay? Um, so I've arranged my particle filtering discussions in a way that's pedagogically might be known as spiral learning. So I'll try to build up some intuitions at first, wave my hands a bunch, and try to give the, the basics gist of things. And then we'll circle around, and we'll try to come in with more specifics. You'll see some case studies. And then we'll circle around again, and I'll talk about some of the probabilistic underpinnings, much as I pointed to them with HMMs. I won't go as deep as I can because this is a this is a technique that can be understood sort of at least four different levels. One, the level of philosophy. What does it mean to have a model that's theory based that's corrected as evidence comes in? What does it mean to have a salient theory if the model is reinterpreting the situation as new data arrives. Two, at the level of intuitions. Our gut feel for what's going on with particle filter can be very strong. You can arrive at a really good grip on basically what's going on. And uh, I'm pleased to say and to see that some of my students, like Xiao Yan, have developed this intuition. You just get this kind of zen for what's going on in that model um, that will help you understand why it's struggling in some case and give guidance, um, guidance to more junior uh, compatriots such as Zuru and, and Olivia. Three is the level of the probability, probabilistic understanding of what's going on the level of recursive updates as new data arrive that don't allow us to have to reinterpret all previous data, but just layer the understanding from a new data point on what we had deduced from previous data points, much as we do with hidden Markov models in the forward algorithm. As a new data point arrives, we use our understanding of what states were from last time and transition matrix to update that, and, and there's a much more sophisticated analog with particle filtering. And it's beautiful. But at the la lowest layer are terms uh, that involve sequential importance sampling and techniques involving the detailed implementation of how you capture those probabilistic, um, those, those, uh, probabilistic relations using these particles. And finally, if I might say a fifth layer, how you implement it in a model which turns out to be not too bad, as I can tell you, having made many such models. Um, and I've shared a model with you that we'll be walking through together that will give you a very concrete sense of despite all these layers of understanding, really it's not too bad to implement. Okay, um, So we're going to aspire over the next day and a half to give you that rich understanding. Um, okay. Um, Okay, um, I have a lot of uh, preceding things in this presentation which went through some, some basics. So, so look, um, uh, I had talked about with system data science um, the need to inform um, uh, simulation models and the need to update those simulation models using evidence from the world. And I'd like to point to an exemplar context to which we'll come back and back and back with case studies and with other um, discussions to build intuitions. And that is an outbreak response. Um, so when we have an outbreak, um, an outbreak perhaps of a seasonal 
um, conditions such as influenza. Perhaps in a, it's an outbreak of a new, uh, of a childhood infectious disease that only occurs episodically, pertussis or measles. Perhaps it's an outbreak associated with a new emerging infection. Often we're dealing with concerns around mobilization of health resources that hinge on outbreak detection in anticipation of where this outbreak is going. Um, and you know, there's a certain amount that we can get through regular reporting as to where we're at, but it, it often doesn't tell us what lies beneath the number of, of, of individuals out there who are susceptible to H1N1, knowing that another outbreak occurred in the late 60s, for example. Um, uh, and uh, critically, often it doesn't directly clue us in to what's ahead. I remember in, um, in the midst of the flu pandemic, which occurred in two waves, being told by one of the one of the epidemiologists with the health region that you know she was really interested in understanding is there going to be a second wave because they had to plot dedication of resources um, in place um, that might include you know surge capacity etc and she was really interested in where is this going is it likely we're going to have a, another wave of this or are we past the worst of it very practical question. And observing data till now, as helpful as it is to know kind of where we're at and where we've been, it doesn't really tell us where we're going. And sometimes it doesn't even tell us, you know, um, is this largely a result of more incident cases or a better reporting or, or, you know, higher levels of care presentation because of concern. So the goal here is early detection, anticipating the trajectory of incident cases for this exemplar context in the context of some uncertainties. In the context of, um, of, uh, of, of, disease, of uh, a new and emerging infections, such as H1N1 or such as SARS, um, often there's particular concerns because by the time we build a sophisticated model, the urgency uh, of the outbreak may have passed. So we're interested in building rough and ready models often early on that we can learn with as time goes on as we learn more features of the outbreak. And yet traditionally we build the model and once it's built we start using it for insight but it's it's growing outdated even as we do so. Um, and often reformulating it with new data is a pretty heavyweight process. Um, and one of the reflections here, I'd like you to build this look, just like the weather, weather models, which are really sophisticated these days. Even the most detailed model of health burdens in the population, you know, a sophisticated agent-based model that captures rich heterogeneity with evidence from the literature on all sorts of factors, it's a fool's errand to look to, to point predict into the future indefinitely and to point predict exact number of counts of illness. Let's suppose it's a model of pertussis. We know pertussis outbreaks tend to be very, very episodic, um, or for measles. Uh, quite a few measles outbreaks in Canada come from people who travel back from overseas, say from the Netherlands, and they bring measles back, and then it spreads in an under-vaccinated community. And to expect a model to anticipate the exact timing of the vagaries of when someone will happen to come to Canada with measles into this area of Alberta, or um, the degree to which someone with pertussis will happen to spread the infection. If, if again, it's a fool's errand. There are stochastics that are pronounced. And to try to predict exactly when that outbreak will occur is, is a non-starter. We're not going to be able to do it exactly. And yet, there are some regularities of the situation. The longer it is since the last outbreak within these under-vaccinated communities, the more dry does the tinder become, the more risk there will be of a fire. Less the sparks settle, the drier that wood will be and the more of it will be accumulated to set off a conflagration as a, um, as a new outbreak uh, takes, take, it allows the outbreak to take off. So there are stochastics, but there are regularities. And we'd like a model that, that is not thrown off by stochastics, doesn't become outdated by 
its virtue of the baseline situation by the fact that you know its anticipated trajectory of the outbreak didn't pan out, and that it can be clued in based on where stochastics head, can be regrounded knowing that okay, an outbreak still hasn't occurred, and we'll realize okay now the danger level is higher. So what we're seeking here is models of the sort that we saw yesterday. Um, of the sort with those stocks and flows or with agent-based models that are, can be quickly formulated and frequently regrounded. Um, and uh, we don't just rely on model predictions after the initial state to tell us what to expect in the future, but empirical observations that are woven in with the model. The model state is kept current with the latest evidence and recognizing that that evidence, that the model is fallible, <laughs> The model is fallible, it, it has its limitations, it, it has its oversights, and we need to ground it, but the evidence is also noisy. It's incomplete, it's partial. Just like with HMMs, we have some understanding of regularities that if we were sitting one second ago, there's a pretty good chance we're sitting now. And each data point is uncertain, but we need to marry two uncertainties in a way that yields uh, a consensus estimate in which we can, we can have additional trust. But where the consensus estimate here will be a whole distribution of possibilities shaped by the evidence over time. So here we will reground the model, much as we regrounded that, ABM, that HMM, as new data comes in, we, oh, we're very likely in state B now but we have some possibility of still being A, so it will be with continuous state here. So we'll say, oh, there's probably a lot of susceptibles in our understanding of how many susceptibles are will be shaped over time, but it will be a distribution over all stocks of the model or the entire state of the model. And through the logic of model structure, together with time series, we'll illuminate latent areas of the system, is the idea. So we're trying to avoid open loop models. Okay. Um, I always thought this looks a bit like Joanne Atkinson, but not me. Um, uh, so um, uh, we're seeking to take the blinders off our models. I argued yesterday that you may know your way home from here to your hotel or here to your home very well, but you'd be, you'd be crazy to try it with blindfolds on because we have an excellent mental model, but we need enough humility to realize we need to see what's going on around us to, to reliably navigate. And so it is with models. And yet, traditionally, we've used models that are blindfolded. We build them, and then we lend them our trust, or at least our tentative um, buy-in as a working hypothesis, without a way of, of cluing them in as the situation has changed automatically. We can go through and re-parameterize re or recalibrate them, but the truth is we're busy people and the frequency we, with, with which we do that is a lot less than it should be. Um, here we're seeking to take off the blinders of our models, to clue them in as new data comes in. And I argued yesterday that it's a matter of going from something like this, where we have data over time that we are going to anticipate from a model that was built back here at time zero. And over time, that model's estimate about what likely will occur will grow more and more stale. This would be as if January 1st, we got our weather forecast for the year. Imagine that in Saskatchewan. Weather forecast for the year. You know, July 30th, cl partially cloudy skies with risk of a thunderstorm. Um, <laughs> By, July, by January 2nd, it would be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, uh, as the ice thaws and we have an odd, cold, an odd warm smell. Um, uh, but, ladies and gentlemen, if we relied on that model as it was built as of January 1st, it would offer a lot less value. What gives us the value, of course, is its regrounding. And in this case, we're seeking to do something like this. As data comes in, we're seeking to ground it. Cheyenne knows where these come from. Um, one recognizes the lion by its claw, indeed. Um, um, so um, here, we are grounding model, the model as data comes in, 
we have model expectations expecting one thing, new data comes in, we say, oh, this is what's actually gone on. The model may expect an outbreak as a significant possibility, but it didn't happen. And the model is clued into that fact and therefore knows more susceptibles have built up in the meantime. Um, and here, taking into account this data, then we can forecast forward. We can ask counterfactuals, like if we put into place this intervention or that intervention, and we can assess what's probably going on right now in terms of full model state, in terms of everything we've seen from now. For example, there were a few cases here, and we project forward in a way that will take that into account, but more to the point, for right now, we will know that since we had little incidents recently, um, we probably have a lot of susceptibles built up. And we can do so for each groups. Uh, this is uh, child data and this is adults data. And we'll have observations, expectations from models about them. And we'll have data points that clue us in to what actually happened empirically. Um, so that's where we're going. Um, let's talk about this. There's several techniques of significance here. And we'll be talking about several of them. Um, the first of them uh, is MCMC. This is a technique to actually sample from posterior distributions over parameters. And we'll be encountering it on Thursday in spades, possibly by late tomorrow. Okay? Um, here, we're estimate, our focus is on, on uh, sampling from distributions over posteriors, trying to understand what values of, of uh, excuse me, over parameters what values of parameters are more likely and what values are less likely. For particle filtering and, SM and sequential Monte Carlo methods, um, of which it's an exemplar and the most common exemplar, we're going to be sampling from the state of the model. We're estimating the underlying situation in the model. For the models we've dealt with where we have susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered, we're going, to be we're going to be sampling from, in other words, estimating how many people are in each of those states as a joint distribution. So some particles are going to say, I think there's lots of susceptibles, few exposed, some infectives, and a lot of recoveries. And other particles will say, I quite disagree. There's a moderate number of susceptibles, comparatively few recoveries, but we've got a boatload of exposed um, who are soon going to be getting infected and comparatively few infectives right now. Different particles will have different takes on the situation, different um, hypotheses, different running hypotheses about the current situation in the model. And they will be competing in a survival of the fittest for which of them best explains the data. We're also in particle filtering going to estimate stochastically evolving parameters and we will use this to assess scenario results and scenario gains from various counterfactuals as well as for a um, posterior. So we've pursued this in many parts and I need, to I need to cite the leadership of my colleague who's not here right now, uh, uh, Dr. Zhu Xin Liu. Um, I learned so much of, of what I'm communicating in this boot camp about particle filtering, particle MCMC from her tutelage. Uh, she's a remarkable researcher. Um, many of you had the pleasure of seeing her over lunch as she stopped by our table. Um, but I really owe so much to her for, um, for our joint work over the years. So particle filtering, um, I want to introduce a few key facts, okay? So if you had to fly home because of a, you know, a, a situation back at home that requires your care, you'd leave the room with a few key understandings of particle filtering. So particle filtering is used with dynamic models that exhibit stochastics. If you have a dynamic model that's totally deterministic, that if you start it in the same state, it always gets to the same end state, it doesn't make a lot of sense to use particle filtering. It does to do MCMC and by extension to some degree to do PMCMC. But for particle filtering, it really requires a model that's humble. And part of that humbleness is enough stochastics that it's open to different interpretations of what's going on. It can't be just putting all its eggs in one basket 
of this is what's going to happen. You need a model that, that has a certain give and take about the underlying situation, where some particles are positing different things than other particles. And the normal way we achieve that is through stochastics. Um, uh, the model is going to run typically, just according to standard plain old model equations. Might be shortened as POME, P-O-M-E, plain old model equations between observation points. Each particle is going to be positing a different theory for what's going on in the world. And each particle going from after the last update following the last observation to the next observation is just going to run forward in its normal way. It's just that plain old model. Maybe it's an agent-based model and it runs forward. Maybe it's a differential equation model or a you know, system dynamics model just runs forward. Whatever it is, it runs forward. The entire state, um, at the time of an observation, the observation clues the model in to what's going on in the world, but in a partial way, in a noisy way, in a way that's somewhat ambiguous. And the under, model's understanding of the state will be corrected to align with that observation or be adjusted. It will maybe, if we have lots of infectives, it will lend credence to particles. It will upweight particles. It will tend to give more, more belief into particles that are that posit a lot of infectives than, than if we had seen a small number of, of, of a small amount of incidents. Particle filtering is performed recursively. And we technically, the term in computer science, which has emerged for this, goes back many decades. And we say that it's performed in an online fashion. Okay, uh, Each new observation that comes in updates our understanding from previous observations without requiring us to go back to all previous observations and reconsider them are sort of operating off the going understanding from before the new observation. And when that new observation comes in, it kind of tweaks that understanding. It tends to emphasize particles by giving them more credence, more weight, that are consistent with the new data point, downplaying ones that are less consistent, um, that, don't, that aren't consistent with the empirical evidence. And it does so without re-examining all the previous data. Okay. This makes it extremely useful and extremely an almost <coughs> ideal mesh with streaming data, with data that comes in. As new data comes in, we mesh it with the, with the model, and the model gives new updates. A technique pioneered by Lucia Swan. Particle filtering has loose distributional assumptions. And I, I say this partly for those in the room who may be familiar with a, uh, an earlier technique, a much earlier technique that, eliminated, that originated in the 1950s with Rudolf Kalman's work, and it's called the Kalman filter. This is a technique that all of you have used and are benefited from at one level or another. It's in your smartphones, if you have iPhone or Android phones. It has been responsible for your safe flights here, for those who flew here. It is responsible for your navigation and a car GPS system. It's a technique for integrating new data with expectations from, from an existing system, such as your bearing and how fast you're moving in a way that meshes both. And it can do so many you know, hundreds of times a second, if not thousands of times a second. Common filtering is great when you have frequent updates needed. For health needs, Epidemiological needs, it's typically way too efficient to be required. We don't need that level of computational frugality. And in fact, that level of computational frugality requires common filtering very tight assumptions about the distribution. We require an assumption of normal errors, so normally distributed errors in our measurements, for example. or normal perturbations to the system stochastically, which just tend not to fly when it comes to epidemiological data. Um, by contrast, particle filtering 
has very loose assumptions. It's an extremely versatile and general technique that doesn't require tight assumptions. And it has, in contrast to common filter, which requires your underlying system to be linearizable. You have to compute the Jacobian, for whom that's a familiar notion, of the system equations around the current best estimated, most the, the its privileged state point, the most likely state that it's in. Park filtering does not. You don't need linearization with your system. You can do it with an agent-based model where you can't easily linearize it. It can be used with a wide variety of types of models. Okay, now you may be wondering, what does this have to do with particles? Um, and indeed, if you search, um, so when Wade was considering a model, building a model with particle filtering for hospital-related factors for emergency rooms, which he's done, um, uh, and, and has contributed some, some nice um, early work with. I looked up particle filtering for hospital, um, hospital models. And everything I found was very interesting, but I found lots of papers on like airflow and filtering particles um, out from <laughs> hospital you know, wards and so on. So you may wonder, what does all this have to do with particles? Well, it turns out that the way in which this is done, the way in which particle filtering works, is it has a distribution at any one time for the underlying situation in the model. The number of people in this state, or that state, or that state, or that state. You know, number of people with S, uh, this, this, who have, um, this many people who are susceptible, this many people exposed, in fact, to recover. It has a joint distribution over all of those and over any dynamic parameters. Um, and as new evidence comes in, it shapes the distribution. It makes, you know, it'll tend towards distributions that posit more susceptibles as it sees more infections taking place. Or it posits more people in the recovered state as it's seen a lot of recent infections. Here, ladies and gentlemen, the, what, the reason we have particles is that distribution that it posits about the underlying situation is approximated by samples. Just as if we wanted to sample from a, gosh, I could turn this into a distribution. There we go. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice uniform distribution. If we, wanted to, if we wanted to approximate this distribution, we could sample from it, we could draw from it, and have maybe 1,000 or maybe 10,000 samples, and that would, that would approximate the distribution in the sense that if we want to draw from the distribution, we could draw from those samples, and it'll be very similar in, in distribution to the underlying distribution from which they were drawn. So here, we're gonna have samples from this distribution. That's how we represent the distribution in the particle filter. And each sample is called a, a particle. But some samples are viewed as having greater credibility or, or more plausible or more highly represented. They're lent, they're lent greater credence than other samples. Some samples are very consistent with the data consistently. And we say, wow, well, that's a sample I want to imitate. That's a sample that I, I put a lot of confidence in because it's been consistently in line with the evidence. What that particle held to be the case turned out to align with the evidence I've seen thus far. And the way I indicate this is with a weight. And if a particle is, one particle is twice the weight of the other, we treat it as being twice the significance. In other words, it's twice as well represented in our collection of particles. So if we draw from particles, we do so with a probability of drawing each according to its weight. So we'll tend to draw one with a weight of two twice as frequently as a weight of one, okay? Um, so each sample is, is called a particle, and each particle has a weight associated with it that represents kind of the plausibility or the credence we put in with it. Um, and particles critically capture competing hypotheses for the underlying system. So one particle will say, I think there are thousands susceptibles and 
you know, two exposed and one infected right now and 43 recovered. And another particle says, uh, you're out to lunch. You know, there's actually only 721 susceptibles and, you know, there are 20 exposed who will soon be getting infected and you'll see, I'll tell you. Um, and there's, you know, three, three infectives and uh, 21 recovered. And another one would say, oh, you're all crazy. There's only 10 susceptibles left. Everyone else is recovered and there's one infective remaining and no, no exposed. So these particles each, they posit a complete hypothesis about the state of the world. Each particle has this sort of take on the world, this sort of, um, uh, this sort of interpretation of the world. Um, that's very concrete. It's the state of the system that that particle believes is the case. And the particles are competing. They're competing in a survival of the fittest. The ones that are consistent with the data as it comes out, that, are, that thrive in the crucible of empirical evidence as brought by the empirical data, they will multiply. They will be, more of them will be, will be uh, distributed there. They'll have a higher weight and they'll be lent more and more credence at some point this resampling process will take place and there'll be more of them present. They'll, they'll be fruitful and they multiply. The ones that are consistently you know, poor performing, that don't match the empirical evidence, will be downweighted and during a resampling event they're very likely to die out. So there's a survival of the fittest where fitness is generated by capacity to measure, to match the empirical data as it arrives. So they are being judged, they are being shaped by, our understanding in terms of the distribution formed by the particles is being informed by each new data item. And over time, we weight particles more, we downweight particles, and we go through a resampling, and the particle dis distribution changes and what that induces is a change in the distribution that we, in other words, what we think the underlying state of the model is, the joint state of the model between all its stocks. And this exploits the principles of importance sampling, and particularly sequential importance sampling within its formulation. So um, we have these particles with weights, and a particle that has a weight of two is worth twice as much as a particle of one. And we always, we never take a particle on its own terms and just look at, we shouldn't be looking at all particles on equal terms. When we want to summarize what's going on in the model, we draw from the particles with a probability of drawing each according to its weight. So if you want to plot out the distribution, we'll draw from the particles, the probability of drawing each according to its weight, and we'll plot those ones we've drawn. So the ones that are weighted a thousand will be sampled a lot, and those that are weighted 0.1 will be sampled very little, and so we'll tend to have a distribution heavily weighted towards those that are, have high weight. And why do we do so? Because weight indicates consistency with the evidence. Those are the particles that have survived in the survival of the thinnest. Those are the ones to which we le lead credence, uh, we lend credence. Okay. Um, so I'm going to come back to this tomorrow, but um, I want to give you a few, um, a few analogies to leave with you. Um, and we're going to see a lot of this tomorrow. But I want to analogize this to a situation that I've referred to several times, which is weather. I, even earlier in this lecture, I referred to this. Ladies and gentlemen, with weather models, Again, it will be a full sermon to, to use a weather model created, however good, created in January 1st of the year and use it for the rest of the year. Instead, we update that model with new evidence so it's kept always fresh. It has a distribution of possibilities for what might happen and perhaps even for what is happening to a certain degree. But it, um, in terms of things that it, 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 the, the weather stations don't measure, but we use this to always anticipate the future state. It's the updated model. And this is what particle filtering gives us. It gives us this update to our model as new evidence arrives. We reground our model in that evidence so we can look forward. Just like we can predict tomorrow's weather 
based not on that model from January 1st, but that model, same model, but regrounded as of today's situation. Hmm? So this is one thing that particle filtering is like. It's like your weather reports. It's common sense. You don't take that model as of January 1st. You take the model as it explains today's evidence. And it allows us to incorporate the most recent evidence and then project forward in light of that latest evidence. We can also analogize it to population tomography. So this approach will take many pieces of data that are terribly incomplete, that relate to terribly small pieces of the system, and it will weave them together into a portrait of the system as a whole. And the analogy I like to make here is that of a CAT scan or MRI scan. I'm not sure how many of you uh, are familiar with these, but if you t consider a CAT scan, here we have a, a machine. It takes images from many angles, and each given image is very incomplete. It may be partly occluded by bones, you know, between the receiving area and the transmission of the x-rays. It may have only a very small portion of the person's body within it. It may have fuzziness induced by those occlusions. Any one image is terribly incomplete. But collectively, if you put together these images, what comes out is extraordinary. It's a three-dimensional representation of what's going on because it's woven together, these different images from different angles, each of them terribly incomplete, into a picture of the whole. And that's in many ways similar to what we get out of techniques like particle filtering and particle MCMC. Because this data that's arriving, we're not curve fitting here. We're not just trying to you know, match the model's expectations to the point here in some sort of, some sort of crude way to match this curve as it's been falling out. Nothing of the sort. Ladies and gentlemen, we're instead regrounding at each new data point the distribution of particles. And the distribution of particles posits a distribution over the full model state, all the, all the states of the system. So as new evidence comes in, it rewards certain particles that are more consistent with the evidence. It downplays particles that are inconsistent with the evidence. And those particles that are consistent with the evidence carry understanding about the other parts of the system. So if we've had comparatively few, take the case down here, the lower case here. If we've had consistently few outbreaks, consistently few cases associated with, say, measles here, right? There's going to be a whole bunch of particles that say, well, you know, I there's been no cases recently, but just wait for tomorrow. There's a bad moon horizon, you know? Um, and, and then tomorrow arrives, and there ain't no more cases of, of influenza or of, of measles today than there were yesterday. Um, and that particle will be, will be downplayed in its weight. Others that are saying, no, there's going to be still few cases occurring because of the stochastics will be upweighted. But those particles that are being upweighted, this is a key insight, those particles that are being upweighted, because of the logic of the model, inevitably, the model, the model particles that say, because of stochastics, there's going to be few cases tomorrow, too, those particles will inevitably incorporate the fact that because of that, there will be more susceptibles that are built up. It's inevitable that if they say, there are few cases tomorrow because of stochastics. By the stock and flow logic, or similar for an agent-based model, it will imply that there's a growing number of susceptibles. So all through this time period, not only are we favoring particles that account for the data, we're favoring particles that posit growing number of susceptibles. And what that means is that as they look forward, they're increasingly likely to posit an outbreak. Same thing up here they're likely to pause it an outbreak because they know that the kindling is a building up. 
there's, there's a greater risk coming, um, that there's trouble on the way. Um, so what we're seeing here is we get through particle filtering, through this process, a kind of view, a 3D view of the system that gives us a picture of not just that point in the system where we have the data from, from which we have the data. Excuse my lapse this late in the day. Um, we have a portrait of the system as a whole, of the latent st areas of this system that we don't observe directly, but which are in some sense implied by the logic of the model combined with the data we have seen, whether it's one type of data point or many, they imply something about what's going on within the system, much as if that stream of people were coming in here, it implies something about what's going on there by the logic of how human bodies move and, and uh, the physics of the situation. So here we have the ability to reconstruct based on these observations concerning infectives, oh, concerning infectives, whoa, um, we have the ability to reconstruct some understanding of all these latent areas of the system. We illumine areas of the system where there's no direct data by the sheer logic, the force of the meaning of how the system works, the, the um, indelible logic as captured by the model. Um, uh, clues this into areas of the system, uh, other areas of the system. And this allows us to take into account the logical consequences of these patterns. For example, if we're in the middle of an outbreak, the particles that have successfully predicted this outbreak will be predicting fewer and fewer susceptibles still remaining, and therefore will be clued into the will be clued into the fact that those particles that are most that are, that carry the most weight, and for the the distribution is con on which the distribution is concentrated, will be causing a coming decrease in the number of cases, and that's indeed what occurs. So we are we are upweighting particles that are consistent with the evidence, but the particles carry a complete understanding of the, um, the system state as a whole. And because of this, they can capture these coming patterns that depend on latent states as much as any other thing. They can do far better than just curve fitting based on recent observations of counts of particles. They know the inexorable logic as captured by the model tells us there must be a coming outbreak even though there have been few cases. If we were just doing curve fitting, we might say past results are entirely predictive of future performance. The best, the best judge of the future is what's happened. That sort of backward looking, looking out the back rear view mirror would lead us to think we're gonna have continued few cases. But these particles are more savvy than that because they understand the growing number of susceptibles makes an outbreak more and more likely. And they can capture these future trends uh, as a result of this. And this can allow us to do things like outbreak prediction. So much of this is just due to Xiaoyan's groundbreaking work. Um, it's just remarkable. Um, I, I am so amazed by uh, what she's been able to accomplish. Here's an ROC curve for predicting an outbreak of measles. Um, finally, an analogy that I'll leave you with here, and I will release you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, is of the GPS system. I argue that GPSs are useful not just because they create a a plan for you to get from A to B, which you then print out and use statically, but because they allow you to constantly replan. No matter where you are, where you happen to be, it will reroute you from there. If you go off, if there's construction blocking your way, if, you, um, if there's a street festival and you can't go down a certain street, can't go down Broadway or something because of the fringe, um, if there's other things that cause you to depart from the plan, like a, a traffic jam you emerge, or, or, or a, a phone call from a friend that clued you into slow traffic in certain regions, it will reroute you from wherever you are. It will give you guidance as to what the best route would be, given where you're at. And so it is, ladies and gentlemen, or particle filtering. Particle filtering will give you a sense of where you're at, and we can use particle filtering 
to then examine the effects of interventions. To examine, okay, given that we've learned from past evidence to this point, given that we have this distribution of savvy particles that have been honed in terms of their understanding of the state of the entire system based on recent evidence and that crucible of empirical data, we can examine the effects of interventions for those particles, for that savvy set of particles. We could say if we put in place intervention A or intervention B, which would get us to our goal quicker? Which would achieve a higher gain? Much like that GPS system can say, this route is probably the best given where you're actually at. Never mind where we thought you'd be at this point in your original plan, but where you're at, we'd suggest this route. And so we can do by examining interventions. And so, Sao Yang has demonstrated in some published contributions. So ladies and gentlemen, some analogies that I've left you with. A GPS system, a weather report, a tomography machine. Perhaps they seem fall or field, but they point to the general features um, that are being brought to the table by particle filtering a technique that we will explore in some depth tomorrow in lectures and in case studies by our exceptional students. So thank you very much for your attention today, and we will see you tomorrow. <laughs> 9 a.m. tomorrow.